Ann Arbor's talk station, 1290 WLBY. Time for Damian Farrell and Damian on Design. Each weekend here, he is a local architect with Damian Farrell Design Group. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm well, and you have today the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design. And a good friend, too, i got to <laughs> tell you. I- Lawrence Technological. I love this guy. <laughs> he is a good guy. Lawrence Technological University's Dean of College of Architecture and Design, Glenn Leroy. Glenn, great to have you back on the show. It is nice to be back with you. Thanks for joining us. This is great. And, and you're always you're such a champion of our profession um, of design. And it's just a good time, I think, to check back in. There's so much going on in the world, in the, in the big bad world out there, but also at Lawrence Tech. And so. Uh, which, is, which is, by the way, Lawrence Tech is a good world, okay? It is a good world. Yes, <laughs> it is a good world. Um, and so let's, you know, let's let's jump in. Let's uh, Globalization is huge now, right? I mean, this is a part of what we're all working with. The, the f- big firms, small firms, the colleges, universities, education, culture, the whole thing. You, you know, and it became really apparent during the recent recession Right. The firms that that actually did very well through that recession were the firms that were engaged in global practice. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, uh, firms that were doing business as usual, many of them had difficulty. Not all, but many of them had difficulty. But uh, but uh, the firms that seemed to sustain themselves well were practicing around the world, both big and small firms. And yeah. what challenges did that present for those firms, in your estimation? Well, it, it presents uh, both challenges and opportunities. Uh, uh, the, the biggest opportunity was the, the big work, and particularly in, uh, in Asia and the Middle, Middle East, presented them with the opportunity for, for terrific revenue and a project that could sustain a lot of their employees. But there are cultural problems uh, to deal with, legal problems to deal with, uh, e- economic problems, uh, language problems. All, all that stuff is... is uh, is just so important, and um, uh, you know, basically, it it underscores a new form of practice. Uh, a friend of mine uh, was talking about uh, going after a job in China, and one of the questions that was asked uh, for him on the interview: big job, big mm-hmm. job. You'd know it if I told you, and I'm not going to tell you right yeah. now. <laughs> uh, but uh, but. It, Basically, the, the client in China said, "How time is money to us. Tell us what you're going to do to keep this project uh, going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the answer for this person, and he got the job because of this, yeah. was, was that we have a global practice and we're going to move the project around our offices. We're going to start uh, with our office in California. We're going to move to our office in um, in a city in China, and then we're going to move uh, to our London office. And using using the ability to communicate among those offices, we're going to pass the project around, and uh, and keep it under in production 24/7. And because of the ability to give that answer, that person got one of the premier commissions in the world at that time. Hmm. And I'm assuming that the technology enabled truly enabled it. That wasn't just a marketing line. It's it's You're the technology able to do that. enabled it. You'd know the firm, uh, yeah. and um, and so yeah, it enabled it. Now, what does that say to us as a as an academic institution? It is incumbent upon us to um, truly give our our students a global perspective. Uh, if they're going to have to uh, uh, work in this world, the students, uh, the graduates that are going to do the best are the students that have been exposed to it while they're in school. And so we have made big moves. Uh, uh, in China, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, agreements with now ch- five Chinese universities. They're sending our students uh, here. We do a summer workshop in China. We mm-hmm. have numerous study abroad opportunities in uh, in Europe, uh, Asia, uh, South America, uh, and the like. And uh, and so the whole idea is that uh, not just exposure, but working with people from other cultures. Then is, uh, is understanding Te- languages, understanding culture, understanding global economics, all important uh, to to get our graduates ready for what is emerging as uh, a global practice mode. I, my sense is that Lawrence Tech is sort of leading in this, uh, th- that extent of global interaction. Well, there, there are a lot of schools that are doing things globally, uh, and... Um, and we, you know, certainly we're we're in the forefront. Uh, there are a lot of other schools that are doing it as well. I think we all recognize it. 
but I'd like to think that we're a leader in the extent of how many continents we're working on right now. Uh, Glenn, despite the cultural differences and just the um, strategic aspect of being able to work around the world and, and do these kinds of projects, do the same principles apply? And, and, and there have been a lot of changes, I think, in, in architecture and design over the years. We're going to get into one of those in a moment, digital fabrication. But uh, do all the principles that, that you teach the students there, do they apply the same no matter what country you're doing the work in? Well, you know, the, there are there are differences, uh, particularly in professional practice. Um, so we teach a professional practice course, and the professional practice course is how do we practice in the United States of America? Um, you go to China and uh, and practice, and and the rules, the business rules, are different. For example, a uh, a U.S. firm cannot be the prime architect on a Chinese project. Right. You know, so so there are different countries that have different rules, different modalities of practice, and and so you have to be ready for um, for adapting your worldview. The biggest problem that we have, of course, is language. Um, yeah. um, less so with Western uh, languages, uh, you know, uh, French and uh, uh, Spanish and German. Much more difficult with uh, Asian languages and. Um, uh, you know, particularly when the Asian students come here, um, we have to do extensive work with them on uh, on getting them ready for our classes, which are all taught in English. The fact of the matter is many schools that are running graduate programs in China are using English as their language of instruction. Yeah, okay. Well, I was going to ask whether any of your students are taking courses and, and those choices to add other languages to their portfolio during their studies as they ready themselves for this? Well, th th there are many students that are, that are, are studying uh, language. There, uh, probably there are other universities that have uh, more far-reaching uh, language departments than, than Lawrence Tech, mm -hmm. but we encourage all of our students to, uh, uh, to get ready for language and culture, and, and quite often before we send them out, uh, you know, we have... Uh, uh, kind of sprint courses on here are the basic things that you need right. uh, in terms of language and culture and, and customs and to understand that so you, you don't end up offending people. And what about green design and socially responsible design? Does that play the same no matter where you are globally? Well, you know, uh, it's interesting in, in China, they, they talk as much or more about green design uh, than we do. Hmm. Uh, they, they are very attuned to... Uh, to, to uh, uh, to those sorts of things. So, um, you know, social responsibility, I, I, I do believe, though, in many ways, starts at home. Mm -hmm. And um, we want all of our students to, uh, uh, to understand that they're a part of a bigger society. And, if, and we, we spend a lot of time with our students doing this. And, and in fact, uh, we were recently uh, reaccredited by the NEAB, uh, uh, the National uh, Architectural um, Accrediting Board, and uh, they they um, you know, gave us a with distinction for our efforts on social uh, socially responsible design, and uh, they, they call us a program of, of distinction in that area. Um, you're facing the the reality that 75 percent of the world is now urban, uh, and and cities. Uh, which is uh, where the majority, the vast, vast majority of our work as designers will occur, right. occurs within this global and cultural context. And you're not only dealing with rich clients, sometimes you're dealing with, uh, with clients that are not so well off. And uh, so we, we want our students to be exposed to all kinds of different people of all kinds of different cultures, of all kinds of different races, of all kinds of different economic backgrounds. And um, this is one of the reasons that our... That our uh, we talked about it the last time I was on, I believe, the, uh, uh, our new center, uh, the Center for Design and uh, Technology in Detroit. Uh, we're doing outreach to community there. We're doing, and, and our studios are working with uh, neighborhoods in, in Detroit. We're doing out, outreach with our faculty and students working with uh, high schools in Detroit, high school students, to get them interested in design and to expose them to design. And, and this is just the, the, this, this notion that, that um, uh, the practitioner of the future must deal with people that are not like them and and particularly must deal not only with very wealthy clients who are doing, you know, the big high-rises or the big complexes, but also how do we solve basic problems as designers? You know, when, when you look at the, 
uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, uh, his Usonian house mm-hmm. was was not meant for rich people. It was meant for average, average you know, day, ad, yeah. average incomes. Yeah. Uh, and and I think uh, I think in design we have to look at uh, for our future. Do do we want to only design for wealthy people, or do we want to solve um, uh, in the way that we can through our physical design uh, solutions um, social problems in terms of things like access to housing? access to services. Mm-hmm. And, and it's something that if we educate our people well, we're going to be much more responsive in that area. Well, we're seeing this incredible uh, development of interest. Um, we've had these waves before, but I think it's really moving now. Uh, the whole prefab, modular, partial construction, factory construction, call it what you will, um, movement that's coming in. And that sort of segues into something you guys are really working into, uh, the, the whole world of digital fabrication. Absolutely. And, and all of and, that uh, is very much aimed at, at the middle person, if you will, right? This is a, about affordability and accessibility. I, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole idea, yeah, you, you, can, you can take down production and fabrication costs by doing it uh, digitally. Uh, and, uh, I mean, when you look at the design and production digitally, you have to look at it not only for, the co- uh, for cost, but Frank Gehry has to use it. Uh, it, it right. It's a as well because uh, you know with the with the curvy shaped buildings that uh, that uh, he deals with he has to use digital design and fabrication in order to get those shapes and it's and the programs that they use are very much akin to what the automotive industry uses in terms of servicing automobiles uh, just think uh, before uh, Damien I don't know how it was with you but when when I was uh, starting in architecture uh, you know, you always started your projects. Uh, maybe you didn't, but I did with a grid because that's what we constructed in. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, then you would deviate the grid uh, as you were going through design. Now you can basically build anything you can think of uh, because of the ability to use uh, digital design and fabrication, uh, parametric design, which uh, which makes adjustments uh, in shapes and forms and structural systems and things of that nature as you're making changes. So, um, you know, we, we feel really fortunate to have both transportation design and industrial design, and we have a partnership with the company uh, that, that, uh, that does a lot of the digital design programs right now. And so, I, you know, I, what I'm seeing is, is the movement, when I started as dean here 10 years ago, from AutoCAD to Revit, and now to the introduction of more parametric design programs uh, and digital fabrication. And we have a, a group here called the Make Lab under Professor Jim Stevens, uh, who um, um, who has been doing this for quite a while. And uh, one of the things that we are working on right now, and if you come by our building, you'll see a big, uh, a big wooden structure. They are using uh, digital technologies and fabrication to experiment on, new, on, on a new building system for affordable housing. And they're testing it structurally. They're testing it for affordability and, and that sort of thing. And uh, we're also in a partnership with Habitat for Humanity, right. where it is our goal to revolutionize the way that uh, habitat housing is, is produced. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, basically we're still using uh, uh, construction techniques generally in the building industry uh, that, uh, that have been used for, I don't know, what, hundreds of, hundred, hundreds of years, yeah. wood, wood framing. Right. Uh, and and stick built wood framing, uh, as we as we say in the trade, one one piece of lumber at a time, and uh, fabrication can can lower uh, the cost and the effort involved in that. And as we face the problems of the 21st century, uh, I think it's important to recognize that we may we may want to face those problems with. Uh, with different kinds of technologies that allow us to do things more effectively and efficiently. We're talking with the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University, Glenn Leroy, on Damien on Design here on the Lucy Ann Lance Show, Damien Farrell. Uh, Dean, when you talk about this partnership you have with Habitat for Humanity, how, how far can you take this? I mean, what, well, what, what I mean, is the goal? Well, I mean, we're hopefully uh, in the next year going to get ready to build a prototype house and then test that, and if that works out, uh, hopefully, and uh, you know, this is looking to the future, uh, dealing with more generalized construction and uh, hmm. perhaps revolutionizing the way that housing is, is being done. So are you literally um, cutting and shaping the parts and pieces at the school? Is that how it's, I've seen the structure out there, but I'm not aware of, that, of the bridge between the idea and what's actually happening on hmm. site. 
I have this very excellent, this really excellent article that was on the Detroit News just recently yeah. um, about this effort you guys are doing. Is that how it's happening? Yeah, our, I mean, our, our students are designing and are fabricating in our shop uh, these these parts using using digital technologies. And the, the beauty of digital technology is is the, the, the cuts are so precise. Right. I mean, you know, you you, you get a stick built project and you're and you're using um, uh, table saws and the like. You can't get the, the cuts as precise as you can with laser cutters and digital technology. So everything fits together uh, like a puzzle. So how would you just how would you try to describe that to a listener? How, how does this look different from a stick frame structure? Well, it, it, uh, it's prefabricated, so it goes up in parts. Uh, the, the structure that we're experimenting r- uh, with right now is in, is, is you, I mean, you can see a house shape in it right now, a pretty conventional house shape at this yeah. point. Uh, but, uh, but it was fabricated in three parts and then assembled on site. So the parts came, uh, came from, our, from our workshop in, uh, in big pieces and then lifted into place and, and fastened. So it's not and two by fours nailed together anymore this is things it's, that are they're they're composite specific. systems they, right. they do use wood but it's a but it's a composite system that they're structurally testing and they've actually tested it at far times the um, uh, many times more than the uh, uh, than what is required by code for loading uh, because of the preciseness of the technology and the and the methods of construction now as they get into it they're going to try and lower the the amount of material that goes into the house while still maintaining the you know the structural safety factors so this is pulling things more out of plywoods and things that are adhered in thin sheets together for strength as exactly. opposed to a two by four exactly. and that's the, really and the difference uh, you know they're, they're, they're composite structures yeah. of wood uh, of, uh, they, I mean they do have two by fours in them or two by sixes mm-hmm. in them but uh, but it's, it's it's the way that you would hear the plywood the, the preciseness of the cuts and and, and that sort of thing, that uh, and the way that they're fastened together that make it, uh, uh, you know, structurally very sound, uh, but also very precise and uh, and less expensive. And they're doing some experiments now on uh, how do we how do we lower cost and raise efficiency. All right. So if cost can be lowered, how can this apply then maybe to the commercial market? When we've been talking a lot, uh, Dean Leroy, about affordable housing here in our community, the disparities between the different communities. And how do you get developers to uh, create more affordable housing? Part of the problem is the regulations revolving around uh, development. Um, is this really something that is going to be um, a moneymaker or not for the developer? All these issues play into that. What is your comment on that? When you talk about just this process could be less expensive, is it really applicable in the commercial world? Well, I mean, that's that's what we're hoping to prove. I mean, um, um, we're start. We're going to start with a with a relationship with Habitat, uh, but uh, but if we can prove that it's effective and efficient, then uh, you know we're we're in a university, so so uh, we are going to make the information available to others because that's our public responsibility and public duty, and and hopefully they will they will pick up on it because you're relying on those free market. Uh, uh, Kinds of enterprises to to pick up on the things that are efficient, effective, faster, and cheaper. Taking that one step further, though, and maybe Damien can really chime in on this uh, since since he, he is an architect building things here in Ann Arbor and he knows the uh, system how it works. Mm-hmm. I mean, have regulations gotten out of hand? Codes and everything that revolves around that here. Uh, I don't think they've gotten out of hand necessarily. Maybe they haven't caught up with technologies. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in other that words, I would agree uh, with. Yeah. I think that's the that's the statement. They have not caught up with technologies, and actually, in, in my opinion, particularly in the heating and cooling world, hmm. uh, in the comfort world, um, not so much in the in the structural. Mm-hmm. Um, in my current experience, um, but but yeah, I, th- I would say that some of the codes are definitely lagging. Uh, per, uh, so perhaps uh, not out of hand, but maybe not necessarily in hand because. Hmm. Uh, codes are created by bureaucracies that don't adapt as quickly to change. Yeah, yeah, we're always but, working with codes. I, I mean, when you talk to them, they they'd like they'd like to work with you on it, yes. but they look at the book, and the book says something different than what you're doing. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, Glenn Lawrence Technological University sits in Detroit. Yes, this is does. a great city. Well, this is a city. Detroit region, yeah, and now in Detroit, Detroit region, <laughs> but a city that's 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 getting international attention, particularly in the design architecture world for 
what is going on here. It's become the topic of, of a great deal of studying and learning, particularly other architecture schools around the world, from what I understand. Has that, does, does that or has that affected the way LT, LTU works or goes about its daily business, being where you are? Well, actually, you know, Detroit is is now in the design world considered a hot spot. Yeah. I mean, five six years ago, people would say I'd go, I'd be I'd be traveling in China or, or or someplace like that, and you'd say where are you from? You say Detroit, and uh, and they they would say something. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I <laughs> hearing about all your problems, you know, <laughs> bankruptcy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now now Detroit is considered a really hot spot. Every you know, yeah. people are, want to come. Uh, here from around the world to to do to do design. Yeah. It's less so led by architecture, I think, at this point. But the designers and the artists are really are really into Detroit, and and I think they're into it because it's maybe a less expensive place to do to do business, and also it's very accepting of uh, of innovation, as it always has been, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the, the mixture of art and crafts from the beginning of the 1900s and the automobile, the mechanization yeah. of that. Interesting mix, isn't it? Well, one of, the, one of the strongest things that we've done in our school, uh, and when I came here 10 years ago, we had basically three areas for programs. We had uh, architecture, we had uh, um, uh, interior architecture and interior design, and uh, and then we had uh, something called, uh, it was it was really like, uh, three-dimensional imaging for architecture, uh, you know, uh, graphic design for architecture, if you okay. will, doing mm-hmm. uh, building walkthroughs and things like that, digital technology. And now we have 13 programs, uh, and they range from 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 architect from those three. Although we've the uh, digital technology, we it has been split into graphic design and uh, and also interaction design. Graphic design being two-dimensional, interaction mm-hmm. design being both three-dimensional and time-based. Uh, mm-hmm. Design, uh, so so design and movement, um, game art, doing video games, uh, transportation design, industrial design, a whole range of things. Now, what that has done for us is it has enriched the school. Um, right. uh, that if you're studying architecture, you learn something by being exposed to people doing transportation design and the programs that you use for. Um, for dealing with surfacing of automobiles applies to the to the surfacing of of architecture, and and so the interface, the multidisciplinary interface among all of these disciplines, really makes for a much stronger school and a much stronger educational environment. Yeah. Well, we've, there's never enough time to cover all these fascinating topics. Um, I want to thank you for joining us again. Um, I think this ongoing discussion about architecture and design, how it's evolving, how it's taking a, such an important place in society these days, um, and the way architects and designers are so engaged in our communities as opposed to just being off somewhere doing a some sort of magical, mythical design exercise that results in buildings that show up. It, it's changed, hasn't it? And it's, uh, it's, great to, it's great to talk about it and... It's Do always it. it's always evolving, and I think that's what makes it fun. This uh, the design professions never get old. Uh, yeah. We do a, we do a lot of things the way that we did in the past, but but there's always new challenges, new technologies, and and as as long as you're as you're open to those, um, and and open to the to the changing world, uh, the the profession, the design professions are always interesting. Glenn Leroy, Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University. Our guest today on Damien on Design with Damien Farrell. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Thank you. I I appreciate it. Okay. You're listening to Ann Arbor's Talk Station, 1290 WLBY.